We kick things off with the shot of a game called Hunter Life. Our hero is a nerd in glasses and he tells us that this game was supposed to be released two years ago. But it's been on hold, just like a Kanye West album. The status of the game is open beta, but with not a lot of features, our nerd boy wonders if this is worth a shot. Either way, he can try out the open beta mode for free so he goes ahead with it. Now, the main character is shown with a whole lot of skills that seem to align with men of culture. He is handsome, he inspires girls to protect him, he is a womanizer with gigolo skills, and most importantly, he is the prodigy of shady activities. This means that his elephant has unlimited stamina and can also copy moves from his partners to further improve performance. Now, we see what the main character looks like, and his name is revealed to be Kento. He is a demon race male who is 15 years old and has all the shady unique skills a man could ask for. Our hero is asked to start the game, so he proceeds without hesitation. Upon doing this, the system tells Kento that it will summon him to a different world. Naturally, this is not what our hero expected to see, but it's too late as a massive flash of light takes over the screen and transports him to the fantasy world of Grimoire. Kento looks around and can only see forest greenery everywhere. He is not the nerdy boy we saw earlier either, as he is looking exactly like the main character from the game. As our hero tries to figure out what he's doing in a forest, he remembers that he was actually playing a game in his bedroom before this. He realizes that he is in a different world now, just like he's seen in anime and manga. Kento is still trying to wrap his head around what's going on, and then he notices a small screen in his vision. It doesn't take long for us to guess that this is a stats bar, which means the standard tropes of summoning have already begun. Kento is led to believe that this is virtual reality on steroids, but we all know that is not the case. Our hero still believes that the wonders of technology have reached new heights, especially with the realistic stats bar. Upon reviewing the details, Kento figures his character has the same stats which he had put in back in the real world, but he does not know if he is currently weak or strong. After a bit more reviewing of his current situation, Kento deduces that he is very much lost right now. The map isn't showing him any town or other kind of information, so he wonders if he should follow the sole black path in front of him. Kento's throat is dry and he's feeling hungry, but is unable to log out, so he blames it all on the developers of the game. Suddenly, he hears some grass noises behind him and looks back, but is only marginally able to dodge a deadly attack that takes out some trees right behind him. Kento is confused, so he looks ahead and to his surprise, there is a giant praying mantis in front of him. Our hero tries his best to dodge the mantis, but gets cornered by the huge monster. He gets injured in the process, so he looks up at the mantis and notices that it is observing him keenly. The monster even smiles back at Kento with a shady expression, which means Kento is in trouble. He wants to run, but his leg is hurt badly, so he is very much trapped. The mantis lands another strike, but seemingly misses on purpose to taunt him. Kento thinks fast and realizes that since this is a game, he will be able to check out his stats for damage. He does exactly that and observes that he has lost some of his HP. If this isn't bad enough, the mantis reveals itself to have the powers of teleportation, and it appears right behind Kento. Things are not looking good for our hero, as he gets trapped by the monster which is not listening to any of his pleas. The mantis prepares for a final strike, so Kento wonders if he will be able to log out of the game if his life is ended here. However, he remembers the impact of the damage he took earlier, and the pain was too real for him to consider this as a standard VR game. The Mantis strikes again but misses this time as well, although it is successful enough to make Kento literally piss his pants. The monster gets closer now, and this time, it doesn't look like it's messing around, so Kento braces for cover. However, at this very moment, the Mantis gets slashed by someone else and is taken down in front of Kento. As our hero notices what has happened, he hears a voice asking him if he is alright. 
Our hero can't believe what he is seeing as a total babe in knight armor is standing right in front of him. She is cute, curvy, and her massive pillows are well displayed by her armor. So Kento is somewhat speechless. The girl asks what's wrong because Kento is looking at her weirdly, but she also states that he's lucky to be alive. After all, the silver mantis he was being attacked by is considered to be extremely dangerous. Kento wants to thank the girl properly, but he seems to be struggling with something. So she asks him if all is well. Our hero has been injured by the mantis, so the girl decides to use her healing power on him. She holds his face and chants a spell that magically heals all his wounds. Kento can't believe that his body isn't hurting anymore, but the girl laughs because it's quite obvious when healing magic is used. She is surprised that Kento doesn't know anything about magic, but he says that it's great to have such powers. The girl maintains that the spell she used was an easy one, so he shouldn't get too impressed. Kento realizes that this girl has saved his life from the mantis, so he wonders if she is a playing character or a non-playing character. He decides to introduce himself to the girl and then he asks if she is a player. The girl reveals her name to be Mili Arya, but she does not seem to know what a player is. Kento brushes it off as nothing but he figures that Mili might be a non-playing character. She has horns and wings, so Kento asks her if they are real or just Halloween props. Mili calls him weird because it's obvious these things are real. After all, she is a succubus girl, also known as a dream demon. She's surprised once again that Kento is not familiar with her race, so he apologizes for not being aware. Now, Mili takes a look at the pea patch on our hero's pants and says that something needs to be done about it. This is obviously embarrassing for Kento, but it can't be helped. So he is taken to a beautiful lake with cold water. As Kento enjoys himself in this lake, he takes out his control panel, which has been beeping for a long time. The bar displays an increasing friendship with Mili Arya, and it eventually turns favorable, although this confuses our hero a bit. These increases, and the word favorable don't seem to strike a chord for Kento, so he wonders what this could mean. Plus, it's hard for a cute and curvy girl to look favorable at a man who has just soiled himself after looking at a giant insect. Kento is not sure if this is some kind of power from the skills he had chosen for his character. Anyway, Kento has to wash his clothes now so he gets down to business. Our hero happily goes through the water, but then he runs into Mili, who is also in the water with him and is in her birthday suit. Kento can't understand what she is doing here, but she says that she only wants to take a bath as well. She teases Kento for being shy, but actually finds this to be very cute of him. The succubus girl has had enough of playing around, so she grabs our hero and asks him if he would like to act out his intrusive thoughts with her. Any normal man would pounce on this opportunity, but Kento removes himself from her pillows and asks her to be more modest. Mili acts cute and strikes a pose, asking our hero to take a bath properly. But Kento tries to run away as he is almost done with his own bath. However, Mili is not going to let him go away so easily, which is why she grabs his hand and holds him close. She says that Kento's elephant definitely feels like he wants to stay here, so she suggests doing unspeakable things right now. Mili can sense that our hero is untouched, so she tells him that he can call her his older stepsister. Instead of giving in to temptation, Kento says that he is not untouched, but Mili doesn't seem to believe him. She continues to use her succubus charm to have our hero violate her, but Kento manages to defeat his intrusive thoughts and he runs away from her. Kento says that such things should only be done if they know each other, but he seems to have forgotten that this isn't the 18th century anymore. Either way, he rushes off to wash his clothes and proves to us that he is indeed untouched. Mili can't believe how serious our hero is, and then we see Kento checking out his stats bar. He can see that his handsome skill has been triggered multiple times, and this has led to Mili slowly falling in love with him. Our hero is in shock and disbelief over the sheer power of his skills, 
but then he remembers that he is quite hungry. Since he does not know how to log out of the game, he figures he will need to put in an effort for food now. Kento finds some nuts, so he decides to chew on these nuts. Later, Mili also shares her food with our hero, but he feels bad for being such an imposition on her. Mili doesn't mind because she has fallen in love with Kento, but then she asks him an important question. He is in the Darvis forest right now, so for a teenager like him to come here all by himself is hard to believe. Kento doesn't want to reveal a lot to the succubus girl, so he says that he found himself in the forest after waking up. This leads Mili to wonder if he was kidnapped, and then she asks him where he lives. She says that Kento's parents must be worried about him, but he says that his mom and dad had passed away a while ago. He also reveals that he comes from a place called Japan, but Mili only focuses on the fact that Kento shares Batman's origin story. She then comments that she has never heard of a village called Japan, even though she has traveled across the continent. Seeing Mili's behavior makes our hero even more certain that she is not a player. Kento finally comes to terms with the fact that he has been summoned to another world. And if Mili is the first person he has met here, then she will be important for his mission. He asks the succubus girl if he can find a nearby road, but he also mentions that he's a bit scared of venturing out on his own because of his earlier session with the giant mantis. Mili says that she does not mind accompanying him, and this makes Kento happy. As a matter of fact, the succubus girl also has to go to a place called the Abyss Vena, so she can take Kento till this city. Our hero thanks Mili once again, but he keeps referring to her as Mili Arya, so she tells him she will only help under one condition. Basically, she wants him to call her Mili, which is actually not a very big condition. Kento is then told that it would be better if he called her his elder stepsister as well, so he turns on Alabama mode. This causes Mili to blush, and it makes Kento realize that she is indeed very cute. He tells Mili to take care of him from now on, and she calls him a good boy. Since it's dangerous to travel at night, it would be better for them to set up camp over here itself. And Millie asks Kento to keep an eye on the fire. As the succubus girl prepares the tent, our hero notices in his control panel that his protection skill has been triggered, and Millie has surely fallen in love with him now. Their friendship has also turned into favor now, which means that Kento is no longer in the friend zone. Our hero figures that certain skills may only be triggered upon reaching certain levels of relationships with girls, but with the rate at which Millie has fallen in love with him, Kento is wielding some dangerous skills. Now, we move to the nighttime where our hero is trying to get some sleep, but is unable to do so because his body is extremely hot. He has been heated up almost as if he is being cooked in boiling hot water. Then his elephant awakens, which means that the heat is of a very specific kind. Millie walks into the tent after hearing all the moans of pain in order to check up on her lover boy. Our hero tells her not to come inside, otherwise he might just do the same thing to her. He wants her to go away, but Millie notices the nut shells that are next to Kento. That's when we learn that these nuts are actually a fruit called Totona. Basically, if you end up eating a lot of this fruit, then you will not be able to control your libido. Millie holds her lover boy close to her, and this is what it takes for him to awaken the beast within. Kento tries to call out to her, but she says that things always turn out this way whenever she is involved. Now, Kento abandons his inhibitions and pins Millie down on the ground. He has awakened the diddler and tells her that he is currently the lowest scum on the planet. Since his inner beast has come out, Kento proceeds to violate Millie with passion. However, the succubus girl does not have a problem with this, as she had made the first move earlier. She tells our hero that he can do whatever he wants to her, so the additional license fuels his actions even further. What follows is a full range of shady activities that cannot be described, but after the multiple explosions, Millie seems to feel bad. She says sorry and asks for forgiveness, after which she reveals that she had taken the life of her first ever love. After that, 
she became Abyss Vena's strongest monster hunter and earned herself the nickname of Iron Maiden, like the band. She then thinks back to what she told Kento while using her charm on him because she was actually afraid deep down inside. Now that she has crossed the line yet again, she could lose another person important to her. This hints at the fact that Millie's kitty may have a fatal effect on elephants, and she is the succubus version of a black widow spider. The next day, Millie gets ready for her journey, but then she notices that Kento is still on the ground and not waking up. Her black widow kitty could have struck again. So Millie rushes to her lover boy and holds him close to her pillows. The succubus girl apologizes profusely and laments that she has once again taken the life of a man she loved. Luckily for her, it's going to take a lot more than a cursed kitty to take down our hero. Kento opens his eyes, and Millie is shocked to see that he is still alive after the unspeakable things they did the previous night. Our hero has no idea what's going on, but upon remembering his diddler acts, he says sorry to Millie. Of course, the succubus girl is just happy to see him still in front of her, and she has tears in her eyes. This also comes as a kind of sudden realization to her, so she decides to explain her race to our hero. Kento is told that dream demons like Millie renew their life energy by gaining the elephant water of young men. This is done through a method known as fertilization, also called various other things, mostly starting with the word F. Now, Millie reveals that the succubus girls have a law stating that they must faithfully serve those who remain alive after doing shady things with them. So, as per her law, Millie submits herself to Kento as his eternal slave, and also reveals her full name to be Millie Aria Black Dagger. Since her rules are absolute, Millie asks Kento to forgive her for having a cursed kitty, and also begs him to take care of her as his new slave girl. All this talk of laws and rules may be a bit too much for our hero to handle, but Millie is not backing away. She proudly declares that she will devote her entire life to Kento as his friend, partner, family, and lover. She also presents an actual black dagger to him as a mark of her loyalty. A moment on the lips follows, and then our hero checks out his control panel to learn that Malie is now deeply in a state of slave love with him. Now it's time to meet more people. So Millie takes Kento to the Hunter Guild where people are enjoying their drinks. The succubus girl explains that the first floor has the tavern and the guild's reception desk, whereas the second floor is an inn and hunter shop for the buying and selling of materials. Since this is a meeting place for all kinds of monster hunters, our hero is thrilled to see so many races together at the same place. Millie asks our hero to wait at a table while she finishes up with her business. So Kento takes a look at some of the patrons. One of them has multiple hands, which he did not think was possible, but then again, that's the wonder of the game. The important thing is that Kento has been able to escape the deadly forest with the help of his slave girl. And now he is in a fortified city. Of course, Kento still needs to figure a way to log out of this game, otherwise he'll be stuck here forever. In the middle of these deep thoughts, our hero does not realize that a cute and extremely curvy barmaid is asking him for his order. Considering the size of her pillows, Kento's intrusive thoughts immediately kick in. The barmaid says that the bill is on Millie, so he can order for whatever he likes. If he had free reign, then Kento would have probably ordered for those milkers, but he must control his emotions, so he takes a look at the menu. However, he is not able to read any of the text because he is not from this world. Kento decides to take the safe way out, so he asks the maid girl what she would suggest for this joint. She takes a moment and then recommends the sautéed fin fish along with the tomato beef stew. The only thing our hero wants to dive in right now are those pillows, so he decides to go ahead and place the order for her recommendations. The barmaid is happy to hear this, and she introduces herself as Faria, but she also seems to know Kento's name. He wonders how that is, but then realizes that Millie must have revealed it to Faria. All of a sudden, Faria comes with some fruit juice and offers it on the house to Kento. 
She also whispers that she will continue to fawn over him, which can only mean one thing. Kento checks his control panel to confirm that even Feria has fallen prey to his handsome skill. His protection skill has also been triggered as the barmaid has brought him free juice. Our hero worries that his skills will get him into all kinds of trouble if it's so easy for him to land such babes. It's all fun and games for now because both Millie and Feria are tens, but if the situation extends to Granny's or Drake's favorite age range, then Kento is definitely cooked. Now, Feria comes with the meal and advises caution because it's really hot. She offers to blow on it, but this is enough for Millie to show up and treat Feria with rage. Obviously, she does not want anyone else talking to her lover boy, so she confronts Feria rather directly. The succubus girl asks Kento if he is all right, but she also refers to Feria as a shady cow milk demon, which is definitely not polite. Millie accuses Feria of trying to honey trap her lover boy, and this draws a lot of unwanted attention to the table. Kento doesn't want any unnecessary trouble, so he tells Millie that he had simply ordered for a meal and nothing else. Everyone falls silent now because they have just realized that Kento is a human. Feria is also a human, so she can't believe our hero has managed to land someone like Millie already. Kento is way too young to be doing shady things, so Feria rethinks all her decisions unless she wants Kendrick Lamar to come for her too. Now, the barmaid shifts all her attention to Millie because she knows that the slave girl has been able to do shady things with Kento. She wants to know all the details, including how our hero's elephant performs, to which Millie blushes and says that her master is like a wild beast when he unleashes his true form. Feria can't believe that a boy with a face like Kento's would be able to awaken a savage beast from within. Of course, our hero is not too comfortable having such a chat, so she asks Millie to take it easy now. She apologizes for getting carried away, and then she tells everyone else that they should not try to approach her master. She particularly attacks Feria again by calling her a cow milk demon, but the barmaid is not going to back off so easily. She also wants Kento badly, but Millie says that everything is fair in love and war, so she will not hand her lover boy over. With that, everyone is asked to disperse, and then we shift to Millie's house, which is more like a mansion. Kento is extremely impressed by it, but Millie reveals that since she is a monster hunter throughout the year, she only uses this house to sleep once in a while. Kanto decides to take a look at his slave girl's stats and is shocked to learn that she is actually one of the VIP beings of this world. Now, it's time to learn more about the mansion. So Millie reveals that before Kento came into her life, she was living here with her maid. The maid is a woman who is 35 years old, and she was the one who taught Millie how to cook. The name of this maid is Annabella, and Millie calls out to her to come and meet her. The maid arrives, but Kento is shocked to see how amazing she looks despite her age. Annabella could easily pass for a college girl judging by her face, but the focus is on our hero, so she asks if he is Millie's guest. The slave girl reveals that Kento is not her guest, but rather her master now. This comes as a huge shock to Annabella, who immediately apologizes to our hero for her casual behavior. It's no big deal to him, so Annabella offers a brief introduction of herself. She states that if Kento is Millie's master, then this house is as good as his. The maid girl offers to take our hero to his room and also prepare a drink for him while Millie unpacks all her luggage. Kento is taken to his room now, and Annabella offers him some crimson tea leaf. The maid girl brings some snacks as well, which are absolutely delicious. Kento compliments Annabella for her skills, and she blushes instantly. She offers some more snacks to him, and then she asks if he has actually become Millie's master. Our hero confirms this, but it only leads Annabella to confirm that he has done shady things with the succubus girl. This is not what Kento wants to deal with, so he tries to avoid the subject while also remembering what Feria asked him. Of course, he's not going to be let off so easily 
as Annabella then asks him if he has shady skills which he needs to perform daily in order to keep his body fit and active. The maid girl now asks our hero if a person with shady skills is required to do shady activities every single day. The reason she is asking this is because an old acquaintance of hers had the same skill. Now, Annabella asks Kento what happened during his first time with Millie, but our hero feels shame for having unleashed his intrusive monster upon her. If the skill cannot be controlled, then Kento may just repeat it again. Now, our hero contemplates whether it was the fruit or his shady skills that turned him into the diddler the previous night. After all, if he continues to diddle Millie every night, then she might not be able to keep up with him. Now, Annabella tells Kento that she will do her best to please him as well. This may seem random, but it's basically our hero's skills coming to the fore again. The maid girl says that Millie is a succubus girl, so her body is made for shady activities. However, even though Annabella has her limitations, she will do everything in her power to keep Kento's elephant calm. Our hero's intrusive thoughts awaken again, but he needs to behave, so he tells the maid girl he already has a slave for that. However, Annabella says that it's fine because if he is Millie's master, then he becomes her master as well. The maid girl is simply looking at this as a duty she must perform, and then she closes in on Kento. He is not sure how he should react, but then Annabella asks him if her old body is not good enough for him. Of course, if Kento was serious, then he would have immediately hopped on to a mommy body, but in this case as well, he is giving in to the dark side. At this very moment, Millie enters the room after changing into her clothes, which look a bit modern. Annabella tells her that something is wrong, so she needs to come here fast. The girls have a talk about Kento acting like a sissy, and then Millie starts thinking of a solution. Her father and mother were a pair, but then again, the chief of the village had multiple slave girls serving him at the same time. Millie is confused and she can't even ask for the help of the succubus assassination squad. So she tells Annabella that they will serve Kento together as he is their one true master. Now, the girls gang up on our hero and tell him that night service is a daily routine which he cannot escape from. He gets a bit nervous and asks if he gets a say in this, to which both the girls resoundingly say no. Now that they have decided how they are going to deal with their new master, the girls take him to the bath. The girls begin to wash Kento, and it's a dream come true for all the single lads watching this video. The girls use their soft and giant pillows as sponges for Kento, and it drives him crazy. What follows is the dirtiest bath anyone can take, and then we shift to the bedroom where both Millie and Annabella are awaiting their master. They wear alluring attire to suit the occasion, and Kento's inner diddler instantly takes over his body. The succubus girl realizes that she was being too selfish in trying to keep Kento to herself. After all, she will not be able to protect him just by herself, so sharing him with Annabella is the correct decision. Things get crazier by the second as Millie and Annabella tell their master to turn their kitties into his exclusive territory. Once again, what happens next simply cannot be put into words, so we shift to after the intense explosions where both Millie and Annabella are resting. Meanwhile, Kento checks his control panel yet again and notices that Annabella has quickly not just fallen in love with him, but has reached the slave girl category, all within one shady session. The control panel does state that the maid girl is very happy to be in this position, but since the diddler has gone away, Kento does feel bad about a widow turning into his shady slave girl. At the same time though, he realizes that the girls are also helping him because his shady skills might erode his body if he does not get a daily dose of violation. The next day, things are a bit awkward between Kento and his slave girls, probably because he is a bit embarrassed of the unspeakable things he had done to them in the night. Now, Millie gets called to her magic guild so Kento follows after her, but he suddenly gets attacked by a random blast. Our hero is able to avoid the damage, but he does not understand where this rage is coming from. 
It's a girl who is extremely angry with him and she charges at Kento, stating that she is going to turn him into charcoal. As Kento tries to catch his breath from evading a lethal attack, the girl continues to charge at him because he has violated her big sister in the most unspeakable ways imaginable. She can't believe that someone like our hero is now the owner of a babe like Millie, so she once again states that she will turn him into charcoal. Millie holds the girl back and asks her to calm down, also revealing her name to be Rena. After Rena does manage to cool down, Millie explains to Kento that she is a researcher at the Magic Guild. Rena seems to be just as shady as Kento, as she also plays with Millie's pillows the same way he did the previous night. Of course, the succubus girl smacks her for being extra weird, and then she tells her to introduce herself properly to her master. She has no choice, so she arrogantly states her name to be Rena Doman, who is of the Rakshasa race. She also happens to be within Drake's age range, but will save that topic for another lawsuit. Now, Millie asks Rena to help them find some information on the Shady Prodigy skill. That's when Rena realizes that our hero is actually a lost person, meaning he is not from this world. The three of them sit in Rena's office as she tells them about her research on jobs and skills. As a matter of fact, she has just used the character judgment skill on Kento so she knows he has skills such as handsome and protection. This can only mean one thing, which is that he is from another world. The reason she knows this is because Kento's skills are unique, but Millie does not understand what this means, so she asks for more clarity. Rena states that unique skills are unlocked based on job levels, so it is weird for someone like Kento to have four unique skills despite not having a good job level. When an exception is born, they are blessed with gifts, which is what has happened with our hero. Rena further states that if Kento is a boy from this world, then he should have been born at least with one job. This makes the succubus girl panic, so she holds her master and asks if he indeed does not have a single job. At first, she had thought that Kento was a villager, but he does not have a certificate of identification. This leads her to speculate if jobless people do exist in this world, but Rena states that there is no such thing as a jobless person who is born here. This finally makes Kento accept the fact that he is not in a virtual reality game called Hunter Life, but rather he has indeed been summoned to another world. Now he knows why he is unable to log out, but he needs more information, so he asks Rena if she knows anything about Hunter Life. She says that she had seen this term before in the diary of the previous lost person who was summoned to this world. However, this was several hundred years ago, so it raises questions about the nature of the game. Anyway, Kento loses his patience, so he grabs Rena and asks her what else the diary said. She is a bit uncomfortable, but she understands the urgency, so she states how the previous person was also stuck here for years and had no idea how to log out of the game. Kento gets the shocker of his life because this proves he is not the only person who was transported here via Hunter Life. He asks Rena what happened to the owner of the diary, and she states that he went on to live his entire life over here, and he also started his own family. Millie notices that the look on her master's face has changed, and he has become a bit disappointed over learning this. She asks him what happened, but he brushes it off as initial shock. As our hero continues to lament his current situation of being summoned into another world, Rena tells Millie that she will save her from this shady devil who will only continue to violate her body. The alternative is to turn our hero to charcoal right now, but he isn't that depressed just yet. Kento casually tells Millie that they should leave because Rena is busy, but that is just an excuse to escape the crazy kitty. Kento still looks a bit down, so Millie talks to him, but he is only thinking about whether he has passed away in his original world. Maybe his entire body was summoned here, and not just his soul, but then Millie hugs him from behind to offer some warmth and comfort. She says that she will always be with him, so she will ensure that he remains protected. This makes our hero feel a bit better, so he thanks Millie for being so supportive. He then realizes that since both his parents passed away, 
He doesn't really have any close friends or relatives back in his original world. Over here, though, he has Millie and Annabella, both of whom are tens. Now, the couple comes across a statue, so Kento asks Millie on whom it is based. She states that the statue is of a man named Orphibor, who is not just the founder of magic, but also the first ever demon lord of the demon kingdom. The Magician Guild is the sacred place of worship for the demon lord as well. The ones who have inherited the blood of Orphibor are called Shinma, and are marked by their black hair, black eyes, and black skin. These are essentially purebreds who are known as the black-colored species, although that kind of term would not go down well in the modern world. Now, there's another place Millie would like to visit, so Kento gets curious. Millie states that if her master is to live in this world, then he will need a certificate of identification. These documents are issued at the Lord's Mansion, so that is where the couple needs to head. However, Millie is not too keen to visit the mansion, and she does not reveal the reason for her hesitation. Now, the duo enters the Lord's Mansion and meet the one who governs this land, Arba Lest Hedu. He asks Kento if he is the owner of the succubus Black Dagger, to which our hero confirms it. He tries to be polite in front of Arba, but the Lord is shocked to learn that Kento indeed has the dagger. He gives our hero an evil look and then asks Millie if she has actually entrusted the Black Dagger to Kento. She says that there is no one else she could entrust her dagger to, and this leads Kento to wonder if it is really such a big deal to possess it. Of course, Arba loses his mind and states that the one who owns the Black Dagger is essentially the husband of the girl who has given it to him. Normally, this dagger would be possessed by the Demon Lord, but for now, it is with Kento. Arba refuses to recognize our hero as Millie's spouse, but she says that she has already dropped out of the race to become the Demon Lord's bride. As a matter of fact, this has also been approved by the current Demon Lord named Sifa. Arba is not ready to let this go, but the succubus girl says that she wants the discussion on this topic to end right now. Kento only just learns that the Black Dagger is proof of being the Demon Lord's bride, and he had no idea that his slave girl was a top candidate for it. Suddenly, Millie tells her lover boy to watch out as a blade comes for him, but it stops right before it can touch our hero. The blade was presented by Arba himself, who has multiple arms, and he confirms once again that Millie's husband's name is Kento. He then says that he is willing to forget everything right now, but only if Kento withdraws from being Millie's master. This presents a tough situation for him as well as his slave girl, but our hero musters up all his courage and refuses to do so. He states that he may not have any talent or anything, but he will never break his promise, especially one made to a babe as curvy as Millie. This makes the succubus girl blush even more, and then a knight shows up to tell Arba to stop with his silly jokes. The Lord puts his sword back into its sheath and lauds Kento for not even flinching despite having such a deadly weapon pointed at him. He then says that such an act of defiance is suited to someone worthy of being Millie's master. Of course, he meant this in jest, but the succubus girl does not feel the same way, so she scolds Arba while also revealing that he is her uncle. She draws her weapon, so Arba asks her if she is really going to end her own uncle, but then she says it's his personality that makes her want to avoid coming here. However, Kento will not be given a certificate of identification unless he meets with Arba, which is why this meeting was necessary. In the middle of all this, the only thing that comes to Kento's mind is the fact that a lord such as Arba is Millie's uncle. The Lord then says that he only wanted to test the man who was able to become the master of his niece. This is because the people who possess the shady prodigy skill are usually very cruel and suspicious. However, Kento is quite different and tough as compared to them. Our hero jokes that he was simply scared to the point where he could not move, but then he asks if Millie was actually chosen to become a demon lord's bride. Arba confirms that what he said is indeed true, and the current demon lord Sifa got rejected by Millie quite brutally. The succubus girl feels shy, 
so she asks her uncle not to say weird things to Kento as he is her master after all. Once again, Kento wants to confirm that the one who possesses the Black Dagger is the Bride of the Demon Lord. And Arba is glad that a boy like Kento has been able to catch on so quickly. As far as the current Demon Lord is concerned, it seems that he too has found himself a bride, so there is no need for conflict. Millie tries to reassure her master that she was only a former candidate to become the Demon Lord's bride, and nothing has actually happened between them. Anyway, Arba states that he will now issue a certificate of identification to Kento. He summons a seal with all his hands and states that he will now carry out a ritual of registration. He presents an authorization stone to Kento and tells him to touch it. Our hero's stats show up, but Arba is surprised to see that he is jobless. The Lord wonders if his device is broken, but if he came to Earth, he'd probably have a heart attack after seeing how many jobless people exist. Millie tells him that Kento is a lost person, which means that he is from another world. Arba can't believe that his niece has gone for a boy who is outside the logic of this world. But Kento maintains that he has decided he is going to live in this world and make it his own. The Lord is pleased to see the spirit our hero possesses, so he recognizes Kento as a resident of this world. With that, he sends a blast at Kento, and it reveals a red card on the top of his hand. Arba is shocked to see a red card, because he has never come across it before, and the same goes for Millie. Kento sees that he has gotten the job of citizen, and as an adjustment, his physical strength has been slightly increased. Kento is just happy to have become a citizen, and he looks at Millie happily. The succubus girl is also pleased by this development, so she tells her master they should go back home. Now, we move back to Millie's mansion where she and her master are inside her library. It looks like Millie is teaching her master the language of this world and how to write it. Kento struggles for a bit, but is slowly able to catch up with the pace. Millie is shocked that her master has been able to master Western language so easily, even though he has only just started with his lessons. Our hero states that some of the letters are the same as the ones from his original world, as they resemble the Roman alphabet. Millie can't resist her urges anymore, so she gets close to her lover boy and gets a nice whiff of his scent. She wants to know if he is fine with shady acts on a regular basis now, to which he says yes. The succubus girl is particularly happy with the way Kento openly refused Arba in front of her as his bravery clearly made her kitty gush. Our hero says that he only stated what he truly felt at the time, and this leads to some romance building. On that note, Millie cosplays as a naughty sensei and tells her master to role play with her. Such an exciting prospect would make any man of culture lose his mind, and Kento is no different as he charges at his slave girl with a passion. Now that he is going to live here forever, our hero figures that he should put in some more effort and become stronger so that he can protect Millie, not the other way around. This is his reality now, and he must adjust to it as soon as possible. Now, we move to Rina who is teaching Kento about the authorization stone, but as usual, she is being mean to him and mocking him for not being able to grasp her concepts at the right pace. Her methods are definitely scary to our hero, but he is thankful that Rena is at least tutoring him after Millie's insistence. After some effort, Kento gets all the answers right, so Rena decides it's time to move on to the jobs. She explains that the residents of this world are always born with a job, and they are classified under villagers, citizens, nobles, and royalty. However, these are basic jobs, and a person can add a regular job to their profile based on their abilities. There are general sections such as being a maid, farmer, or secretary, and then there are battle jobs such as magicians and warriors. Rina confirms that Kento has a red identification card, and she states that there are four other colors, black, green, blue, and purple. There are restrictions on the number of jobs a person can have based on these colors, but red is the exception as it comes without any limits. The vast majority of the people in this land have black cards, 
which means they can only get up to three jobs max essentially. Our hero may consider himself to be useless, but he actually has the cheat ability to acquire everything he wants. Kento is glad to hear this, but Rina reminds him that if he does not put in any effort, then there is no point thinking about the cheat card. Now, Kento learns that apart from him, there are only two other people who have the red card. She does not reveal the names though, and moves on to the skills. They are divided into three categories, namely adjustment skill, battle skill, and general skill. There are certain requirements to activate these skills as well, and this is when Kento remembers what happened when Millie got done with her lessons. Our hero had experienced something similar to what Rina is saying, as his document-making skill got unlocked after he learned Western language properly. He got some skill points from this and tried to distribute them, so Rina says that she is done with her lessons. Then we learn that the only reason she agreed to teach Kento was because Millie offered to let her grab her pillows in exchange for it. As Rina laughs with a shady tone, Kento notices that he has grown to level 10 as a citizen and has gained more skill points. On that note, he enables document creation, and then we shift to Annabella who states that dinner is ready. She asks Rina to join them in the feast, and she happily accepts because she will get to be with Millie and her massive pillows. The group enjoys their meal, but Rina ends up having a lot of booze and she again scolds Kento for becoming Millie's master. Annabella tells her that she has had way too much to drink, but Rina is not in the mood to have that discussion. She has always loved Millie, whom she always refers to as Onisama, and then Kento suddenly sees some fire sparks emanating from her body. Naturally, he panics, but then Annabella explains that Rina has an illness called the spontaneous fireball syndrome. This means that she starts shooting out fireballs when she becomes highly emotional. This is bad news for our hero, so he needs to be careful moving forward. However, Rina is drunk right now, so he will not be spared tonight. She suddenly grabs Kento out of frustration, but she can be seen blushing, so our hero calls her out. That's when she instantly becomes very conscious and starts to panic, prompting Kento to ask her if she is okay. Rina tells him to shut up, so our hero feels it's the booze talking. She maintains that is not the case, and attacks him with a fireball. Nobody has enough time to react to this, not even our hero, so he takes a direct hit with full impact. Millie rushes to his aid, but he is barely holding on to dear life. The succubus girl uses her healing magic on her master, but the damage has already been done, so he does not wake up instantly. Millie begs him to open his eyes as she holds his head close to her soft pillows. Annabella rushes to the scene with a change of clothes and tends to her master along with Millie. Rena feels really bad about what she has just done, as she did not mean to do something so lethal. After a bit of a struggle, Kento does manage to open up his eyes, so both Annabella and Millie are thrilled to see their master alive and well. Our hero does not know what has happened, so he is told that he was about to lose his life just now. Rina feels even worse, so she drops to the ground and begs for forgiveness. She even says that she will pay as much as she can for the damage settlement, but this is not some lawsuit from a TV drama. Millie tells Rena that she does not care for any money settlement because she is going to execute her for the attempted assassination of the Black Dagger household's master. Rena is obviously shocked to hear this, but Kento is even more surprised by this revelation. He then turns to Millie and asks her not to do such a brutal thing because he is still alive and properly healed now. Of course, the succubus girl does not agree with this kind of behavior so she tells her master that he can't be so kind all the time. She then turns to Rina and tells her that she should be eternally grateful to Kento for his kindness. Now, Millie takes out her blade and gives Rina a choice between two things. She can either become a slave girl for our hero, or she can have her head flying over the place for attempted assassination. This leads to a shady party between Kento and his three slave girls. Lots of shady things follow, but Rina gets shocked the most when our hero hugs her because of how cute she was looking. Of course, this makes her very emotional,
but the fireball disappears into a magical pendant she is wearing on her neck. In order to understand this, we are taken to a brief flashback where we see the pendant being offered to Kento by Millie. It is called Kuma's Pendant and has the ability to seal a magician's magic. She then puts this pendant on Rina to make sure her sudden fire attacks don't threaten her master anymore. With this, our hero can finally stay in peace around Rina, and the best part is that the person wearing the pendant will not be able to take it off by themselves. Now, we move back to the bath where Kento asks Millie if Rina has done enough to be forgiven. However, his slave girl tells him that he's being way too kind to the girl who almost took his life. She then states that her master has the power to either free Rina or take her life right now. Tensions rise, but then Annabella shows up to get everyone in the warm water. The bath is nice, but there's an awkward silence, so our hero randomly says that hot baths are the best. Rina then asks him if he is really so against the idea of her being a love slave. Kento says that he's not against the idea, but if Rina doesn't want to do this, then she should not have to do it. After all, the diddler only awakens during desperate times. Rina calls our hero a fool because if she doesn't do shady things with him, then Millie will take her life. However, the more important thing is that Rina finally admits it's not as if she does not like Kento. Since this is her first time, all she asks is for him to be gentle with her. Annabella is pleased to see this, and she admits that things would indeed be tough if only she and Millie were tending to their master's elephant. Once again, Kento asks Rina if she is fine with this, and she agrees with passion. Millie is also fine with it, but she warns Rina that if she attacks her master again, there will be no second chances. With that, she officially forgives Rina and they hug out of joy and relief. Now, it's time to get down to business, but our hero makes sure that his other girls are also there to guide Rina through the process. What follows is a series of explosions for Rina, so she falls asleep right after. Upon waking up later, though, she notices that her master is already getting shady with Millie. She peeps in on the fun, but after Millie explodes, Kento decides to punish Rina for being a naughty girl. Another shady session follows, and she gets even more intense explosions. After pleasing all his slave girls, Kento takes a look at his control panel and notices that his man of culture skill has gone up to level 4. Our hero realizes that he needs to level up on the other jobs as well, because the authorization stone felt funny to him earlier. At first, he notices that Rina has become hostile, so he wonders if his skill even worked, but then he checks the rest of the log and sees Rina also turning into the slave in love situation. This is when he figures that his handsome skill had truly activated back when Rina had held him by the collar. After all, she was blushing at the time, and even Kento was looking at her with intrusive thoughts. Essentially, for the handsome skill to activate, it's important for Kento to also have some kind of fondness for his target, otherwise it will be of no use. This explains why Rina was not subject to his skill earlier as he did not like her then. With these new developments, how is our hero going to move further ahead? Also, with such a crazy cheat skill, would it not be possible for him to 